right, well, the doors are closed, so um, you can't get out for now. Um, so I'm Paul Johnson, director of the IFS, and it's my huge pleasure to welcome you all to this, the second in our series of 50th uh, anniversary events. I'm particularly pleased that this one is about tax, that being the first set of issues the IFS looked at and what, in a sense, we were founded to do. I'm particularly delighted that one of our founders, John Chown, is here this evening. Uh, he, uh, along with three colleagues, set the IFS up back in 1969, in large part in response to the mess that the then government was making of the tax system. Um, we will, to some extent, discuss whether anything has changed in the last 50 years. If the answer is no, then, John, it failed. I'm sorry. Um, uh, the way that we're going to do this this evening is that we're going to kick off with a presentation from my colleague, um, Helen Miller, who's Deputy Director at the IFS and runs our uh, work on tax. Helen, as I'm sure you all know, is the tax personality of the year, 2018, as voted by Tollies. So yeah, you can have a personality and do tax, as everyone in this room <laughs> clearly, uh, clearly knows. Uh, Helen will talk for about uh, 20 minutes. We will then go to a discussion uh, with, uh, first of all, John Kay, um, who is uh, an alumnus of the IFS. All of these events will have at least one alumnus sitting on the panel, and a very distinguished one at that. John was director of the IFS between 1979 and 1986. He wrote, along with Mervyn King, probably the best book ever written on tax, the British tax system. Since then, he has uh, founded a, an economic consultancy, run the uh, Oxford Business School, and uh, been a prolific author in the FT and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, but probably his great claim to fame, he sent over a paper that he'd written a few years ago in which he said that uh, his one great wish is that on his gravestone will be inscribed, he believed in fiscal neutrality, um, <laughs> which is a great wish of all of us at the IFS, um, and uh, hopefully uh, for uh, some time to come. Uh, and finally, um, Gideon Skinner. Now, uh, it, this was advertised as Ben Page from Ipsos Mori being here this evening. Ben was going to uh, fly back from Iceland quickly to get here. Unfortunately, his plane was delayed, as perhaps was um, always a risk. Uh, but Gideon very kindly has stepped in. Gideon is the head of uh, political and policy research at Ipsos Mori, where he's been for the last uh, 20 years uh, or so. And he will uh, probably bring me, Helen, and John back down to earth with a thud when he tells us that the uh, population really won't wear it, whatever it <laughs> happens to be. Uh, that's how the evening is, is going to pan out. We're, after we've had a bit of a discussion down here, we'll throw it open to questions, and then there's lots of time for uh, drink down the corridor, um, which we may need after an hour and a half of tax. Uh, but before we do that, Helen. Great. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> tax is a really big deal. We spend quite a lot of our time talking about the specific ways in which the government spends its money, which is quite important, but a lot less time talking about the specific ways that it raises money in the first place, which is a bit surprising when you think that the government is raising over £700 billion each year. That's 35% of national income. And in fact, tax isn't just important because it represents the government raising and spending over one in three of every pound in the UK economy. Governments also use the structure of the tax system to redistribute incomes and to manipulate various forms of behaviour. So both how much we raise in tax and how we raise it are absolutely central to shaping the kind of society we have. Now, on the how much we raise, that's been increasing in uh, recent years. and It's now at a high since a peak at the end of the 60s. Going forward, there are important debates to be had about whether we should raise more tax to fund a set of public services that are under increasingly visible strain and an ageing population that demands both more and more expensive health and social care. Think it, but so you can, see, you can see from this chart that high levels of tax would be kind of unusual for us historically, but they wouldn't be unusual internationally. Uh, tax at 35% of national income puts us just below the OECD average, and we could clearly raise quite a lot more and still have a state that was smaller than many of our uh, European uh, neighbours. Moving to how we raise tax, we get 60% of revenue from just three taxes, income tax, national insurance contributions, and... VAT. And in fact, most developed economies get most of their revenue from these three broad-based taxes. Those who get more than us tend to get even more in VAT 
usually through having fewer zero rates, and even more through to social security contributions, including more from both higher and middle income earners. If we look back at this, then you can see these taxes have been our big revenue raisers for decades. But you shouldn't let this seeming stability in revenues lead you to think we haven't changed taxes. In this time, we've moved away from <coughs> specific taxes on sales and more than doubled the VAT rate. We've had income tax rates as high as 98%. We have reformed the taxation of saving and made many other important changes to tax rates and tax bases. And what we at the IFS have been keeping an eye on is what, that, what those changes do to the efficiency of, our, efficiency of our system. Effectively, what are the costs that our system imposes over and above the revenues it raises? Now, the idea that tax design is important is not a new one. Adam Smith was talking about it over 200 years ago. But as Paul said, it's been central to why the IFS exists. Early on, John uh, worked on an IFS uh, committee on tax reform and then wrote the great book that uh, Paul mentioned. More recently, we've had our Murley's Review, which updates the ideas of tax design for the new century. And right across our 50 years, we've been doing empirical research on how companies and firms respond to various parts of the tax system. And after all that, as you'd hope, we actually know quite a lot about what a well-designed tax system looks like and quite a lot about where ours falls short. So we have made some improvements, but actually in preparing for this talk, I couldn't think of a tax whose design couldn't be improved. To give just a sort of a flavour of that, um, we have a VAT base that is a treasure trove of silliness. I find it particularly amusing that we zero rate gingerbread men unless they're decorated, then we add 20%. We have an alcohol tax schedule that makes cider the most tax efficient way to get drunk. And the one that I'm surprised doesn't upset more people is that we put a hefty tax penalty on employees. And actually, these are just three examples of very many where we put very different tax rates on very similar activities for no good reason. And that leads to obvious issues around fairness. So, for example, why should a, an employed economist who likes to, you know, her alcohol derived from grapes pay more tax than a self-employed economist who likes the apple-based variety? But more broadly, these choices lead to various forms of inefficiency, and they lead people to basically make um, undesirable choices. So choices that aren't the result of some well-thought-through plan, but that ultimately are undesirable side effects that make people uh, worse off. So what does all this mean for the future? I think one thing it means is that we have no shortage of problems to, to start solving. These problems are not going away on their own. Today's problems will become tomorrow's problems. And in fact, some of them are getting worse. If you think about the stories you hear about tax, I don't know, take our business rates killing the high street, they're often pitched as new problems in need of new solutions, when actually they're old problems that just stem from bad design that just happen to be appearing in a certain way right now. If we want to future-proof our system, I think a really good place to start would be to you know, work down the long list of problems we have and start getting some of them fixed. Now, for tonight, I'm going to resist the urge to drag you through a long list of problems. There are far too many for a short talk. And anyway, it's what most of you will hear us talking about most of the time. Instead, what I want to highlight is the kind of big overarching challenge for us going forward is how do we get things fixed? It's kind of all very well knowing the technical solutions but if you want to reap the returns to a good, you know, well-designed tax system, we have to see more of those ideas turning into policy. That's not a new challenge, but one that I don't think is any less important, and one that we're going to come back to discuss uh, on the panel. With the rest of my time, I want to look forward to some of the ways in which the economy is uh, changing. Now, I don't expect that to radically change where we get revenues from. I think NICS, income tax, and VAT will be our big revenue raises across the next 50 years. But the economy will change in ways that might make it harder to tax some things, or might make us want to make different choices about what we're taxing. Now, given tax is such a big topic, there are clearly plenty of issues I could have picked. So, for example, the ageing of society, the changing nature of work, uh, the desire for more devolved tax powers. But I've decided to pick three that I think are particularly high up for public debate at the moment. And I'm doing that because ultimately, although I think it's highly desirable to have a well-designed tax system that's robust to all sorts of future changes, it's not enough. We also have to have a system that's socially acceptable. And in achieving that, I think a good place to start is by looking at our options in these big areas of key public debate. So the first uh, change I'm going to cover tonight is uh, globalisation. Now, actually, the kind of in increasingly connected nature of the world has always posed a challenge for tax systems, basically because we have national institutions that set taxes based on people or activities within their borders, and that's just harder to do if those people can move across, across borders. 
For one thing, it means you have to spend more effort trying to stop avoidance and evasion, for example, stopping the rich stashing their cash offshore. But you also have to consider how tax affects real behaviours, like where people live or where they invest. And I think these issues have played out most obviously for the corporation tax, where basically since inception there have been concerns about our ability to tax mobile investments and predictions of race to the bottom in uh, corporate tax rates. The UK corporation tax rate has been cut to a third of its 1980s level. Rates have also been cut in other advanced economies, and there's evidence that to at least some degree this is the result of government tax competition. Actually, to the surprise of many, revenues, despite fluctuating with the economic cycle, have held up for most of that period. Now, that's partly because we changed the tax base in ways that uh, mean that more income is now subjected to corporation tax, but we also just got lucky. Revenues were buoyed first by the North, by the North Sea and later by an increasingly profitable uh, financial sector. Now, in coming years, we'll have to continue to make choices about what the corporate tax rate should be. But I think the bigger challenge for the future, and certainly the one that's at the heart of public debates, is how do we want to tax the profits of multinationals? So which, which part of profits do we want to try to tax here in the UK? And I think you can see why that's a challenge and why there's not an obvious right answer by considering how we currently do it. Take the uh, example of an iPhone. I suspect you all know that Apple is headquartered in the US and that the original smartphone was designed and developed in Silicon Valley. But the final product is assembled in China and its production sucks in components from literally around the globe, including displays from Japan, sensors from South Korea, and gyroscopes from a French-Italian company based in Switzerland. And actually, many of our uh, biggest corporations, which is where we get lots of revenue and investment from, have these very globally integrated production networks. And of course, all of the countries in which they operate want a share of the profits. And the way we share those out um, is to use a set of international rules that very broadly and crudely described try to allocate profits to different countries according to how much each part of production contributes to the final value of a product or a service, which is remarkably hard to do, even in principle. And it's been getting harder, first as intangible assets and more recently as digital services have become more important. So think about the big tech giants. Maybe take Facebook as an example. There's a growing debate now about whether we shouldn't just be considering the location um, of you know, where the Facebook brand or the Facebook software or how valuable those things are, but also how valuable they are relative to the data and content added by users. And you can see why all those countries that have users based in them would like that. They'd like more Facebook profits flying towards them. But I don't think it's feasible that we can ever hope to accurately answer the question of how valuable all these groups of users are relative to everything else Facebook does. So this is a complicated system. But stepping back, it's worth remembering that Corporation tax is still a pretty significant revenue raiser, and we have had successes in patching it up. So we could just keep running this system. But I think it's worth saying that no matter how much we keep patching it up, and no matter how complicated we make it to accommodate digital services, we're still going to have a system that has a fundamental problem, which is that it gives firms an incentive to move real activities and profits in response to tax. And precisely because it gives firms those incentives, Governments have an incentive to compete with tax rates. That is the source of the concern about the race uh, to the bottom. And I don't think we can rely on countries all clubbing together to agree on a new, more robust solution to tax multinationals, because there is absolutely nowhere close to agreement across countries on what a robust and fair allocation would look like. And whenever you do change the allocation in a large way, you end up creating big losers. So they're unlikely to want to sign up to this coordinated approach. If we wanted to, then we could unilaterally move away from this system. Effectively, we could stop trying to pin down the very hard to measure, very mobile parts of a company, and instead tax company profits according to uh, activities that were less mobile, for example, the location of consumers. I think for now, that probably feels a little bit radical for most people. But if we, start, if we keep seeing globalization and technology making our tax base more mobile, then those more radical solutions might start to look more attractive in future. So that was the first change. The second change I want to flag tonight is rising incomes of the top 1%. Now, actually, when IFS was founded, incomes at the top have been coming down pretty quickly. Since then, the top have been racing away from the rest of us again. That's a pattern that's repeated across English-speaking countries, and I think one that's led to these growing calls to get more tax from uh, the top. In the UK, the rate of income tax has come down substantially uh, since uh, the 70s. But despite this, the revenue we get from the top has been rising. Now, that's largely the result 
of growing inequality. There is just more income at the top to be taxed. Although in recent years, we've also made policy changes that effectively allow us to get more from the very highest earners just without putting up their top marginal rates. And one implication of these changes is that we're actually already pretty reliant on a fairly small group. We get 28% of tax income tax revenues from just 1% of income taxpayers. That means that regardless of how you feel about the very rich, if they have a bad year or if they move their income or themselves out of the UK, that can be pretty bad for the government finances. But actually, even if we were happy to take on the risk of being more reliant on this group, it turns out that if you just increase top marginal income tax rates, you often don't raise as much income as you might expect. To give you an example of that, in the 2017 Labour Party manifesto, uh, the, the Labour Party proposed uh, extending the 45% rate of income tax to incomes above £80,000. That would affect the top 2% of adults in the UK and to have a new 50p rate um, above £123,000, affecting the top 1% of adults. But actually, even the Labour Party expected that around 40% of the revenue that you might be able to raise would be lost to a behavioural response. And actually, looking at the evidence, we thought that looks kind of optimistic. And in fact, the very rich might respond enough so that those policies raise nothing. And one of the, re one of the kind of keys to understanding that large response and why it's hard to forecast revenues from these kinds of changes, is that when you put up top rates, it can mean that you don't only fail to get the extra revenue you wanted, but that you also lose some or all of the revenue you were previously getting. As an example of that, Scotland recently increased their higher rate of tax to 41%. That's just one percentage point higher than the rest of the UK. And the OBR predicted that, as a result, about 10% of the potential revenue would be lost if fewer than 20 people move their tax residence to the rest of the UK. So an example where you don't need very many people to respond to get these quite large effects. Now, you still might want to put up the top rate. For example, some would like to see higher top rates to directly reduce inequality or to indirectly reduce inequality by shaping incentives. For example, the incentives that the very highly paid have to bargain are very big pay packets. So it is important to consider the top rate we set because to at least some degree, the tax system we have today will shape the economy we have tomorrow. But I think it all still means if we're looking for really big sources of revenue, we're going to have to look elsewhere. Which leads me on to the kind of third change I wanted to highlight tonight, which is uh, wealth. UK households hold around £13 trillion of wealth, and that's been growing pretty strongly in recent years. And I think when people hear that wealth is very large, it's been growing quite a lot, Many of them are quite surprised to hear that we get most of our revenue from taxing consumption and labour income, and they'd like to see much higher taxes coming on these big stocks of wealth. But actually, the fact that we don't have very big taxes on stocks of wealth isn't as counterintuitive as it might sound. If we tax incomes when they're first earned, and we tax the same income, which happens to be sitting in a bank or a house or another asset, we can discourage savings and investment. And it's unfair to those people who just want to sort of save and consume in the future rather than do their spending uh, today. But that doesn't mean we should just ignore wealth altogether. In fact, in the same way we think about how we tax incomes that flow from work, we should be thinking hard about how we tax incomes that flow from uh, wealth. And when we get this wrong, there can be pretty, pretty big consequences. So if we take housing, property is over a third of wealth in the UK. But for, all the, for many of those people who are sitting there with very large capital gains on their houses, they'll pay absolutely no tax on those gains. This is effectively a policy mistake that not only inefficiently skews investment towards housing, it's also unfair to all those people who got their income in other ways and did have to pay tax. Thinking about the rest of wealth, the majority of which is private pensions, <coughs> that tends not to be taxed as generously as owner-occupied housing, but it is the case that we tax capital incomes at significantly lower rates than labour incomes. Now, that's causing some particular concerns right now um, around intergenerational fairness because it just so happens that the large property gains and the large pension pots are sitting with the baby boom generation, who sort of happen to be in the right place at the right time. Looking forward, the younger generations don't look set to be anywhere near as wealthy. But actually, the fact that we have these very different tax rates on different types of capital income and different rates on capital and labour income is a problem at any point in time. And it leads to all sorts of equity and efficiency <coughs> issues. Thinking about how we, you know, changing how we tax capital incomes would be pretty high up my list of things we should fix today. 
But fixing doesn't just mean increasing rates. It's really important that we get the tax base right too. Because it's adjusting the tax base effectively allows us to you know, raise rates without having other negative effects. Now, the way we treat pensions, by which I mean let people save out of their untaxed income and then tax income when it finally flows to them, is one broad way that we can both tax the returns to uh, wealth, returns to capital, without discouraging saving or distorting other decisions. But we can use the same design principles to, for thinking about how we tax other capital assets. And if we wanted to, in, in changing how we tax capital incomes, we could raise more income. Now, we shouldn't be expecting to raise so much more that we radically reshape where we get revenue from, but we could raise more, especially if we're willing to look at the big sources of wealth. Again, if we wanted to, we could also target those changes towards those with the highest wealth or towards the intergenerational concerns. So, for example, we could reduce the uh, tax breaks on pension income, which predominantly benefit those with the largest pensions. And actually, I think it's worth saying that even, you know, regardless of how much revenue you wanted to raise, fixing how we ca tax capital incomes today would have the kind of nice side effect of helping future-proof our system. I suspect many of you will have heard the concerns, I think popularised by the economist Thomas Piketty, that the returns to wealth are going to grow faster than the returns to labour, so faster than wages in future, therefore grow, you know, driving ever-increasing uh, inequality. Others worry about robots becoming much more important, which basically means bigger incomes flowing to the people who invested in those robots. Now, economists aren't agreed on exactly how uh, returns to wealth are likely to evolve in future, but fixing today how we tax capital incomes would make any of those futures less problematic. Finally, on wealth. I've spent time thinking about how we tax the flows from wealth, but we do have a tax that taxes at least some forms of wealth, when they're passed on at death. Now, polls consistently show that m most people across the political spectrum think inheritance tax is unfair, much more so than for other taxes. And this is despite the fact that only 4% of deaths result in an inheritance tax bill. To steal uh, John's phrase, inheritance tax favours the healthy, wealthy and well-advised, but it is still the case that most of the revenue comes from millionaires. So if we wanted to, we could... Look again at inheritance tax as a way to try to stop the transmission of intergenerational uh, inequality. And we could look at some of the practical issues around how we design inheritance tax, but I suspect it still wouldn't be a vote winner, which to my mind means we should be even more careful when taxing people sensibly while they're still alive. So they're my three issues uh, for tonight that I said I've picked because I think they're particularly high up the political um, agenda right now, the public debate right now. There are many others we could have talked about. To kind of bring everything together, taking what I've said, I think there are two things worth drawing out. The first is that tax design really matters. It isn't going to let us avoid the difficult political decisions like how big the state should be and who should be paying, but it does give us more options and allows us to you know, make choices at lower costs. I think it also shows us that many of the new challenges we're seeing aren't new at all, meaning we don't need to start from scratch in inventing solutions. Often just fixing bad design would do the job. The second thing to say is that I think ultimately we all want a tax system that raises enough money in a way that's fair, efficient and robust to the future. Now people like us at IFS can do the efficient and robust bit, but ultimately in getting those ideas into a system and creating a system that's deemed to be fair, we're always going to need a really high quality public debate on tax. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Helen. That was, uh, that was of course, uh, great. Uh, but, of course, only covered a small fraction of all the things that one could have covered in looking at tax. I mean, rather, as the rest of the world, we have neglected tax in this series because we've got one, uh, one lecture on tax and a whole bunch on everything else that tax actually pays for. Um, I was glad you ended up on inheritance tax because I think that one of the best things I've read about tax was the, uh, the, the campaign against inheritance tax in the US, which went like this no taxation without respiration. <laughs> uh, which I think yeah, is a very nice way of putting it. Um, so there's lots of problems still with the tax system that we um, have at the moment. But I thought I'd turn first to John to reflect a bit on how things have changed in the more than 40 years, I think, John, that you've been thinking about this and whether we have 
any reason to be optimistic that things have been moving in the right direction? I think we do. Uh, but I'd like to take a moment, since it's an appropriate occasion, to reminisce on history of tax and IFS, to recall an exchange that go, I think occurred 43 or 44 years ago in IFS, when we were working on the Mead Committee. And we were having a discussion about concepts of income as applied to taxation. And one of the members of the committee, who had been a deputy chairman of Inland Revenue, said, why can't we just have a common sense definition of income? And the trouble is, there isn't a common sense <laughs> definition of income. Defining income is complicated. What tax design is fundamentally about is taking economic and social concepts and trying to turn them into things that can be legislated about and administered and to which you can attach location, which, as Helen has been explaining, becomes harder and harder in a more globalized world. And that's the job of tax design. And it's a difficult job. And it's a job which is it's easier to turn some economic and social concepts into things that can be legislated and administered than others. As far as wealth is concerned, in my view, it's almost hopeless to actually turn wealth into something we can effectively turn into a legis le 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 legislated and administered concept. As far as income goes, it's pretty difficult. It's particular, as that 44 years ago discussion showed, it's very difficult and getting more difficult as applied to profits. It's quite difficult in relation to capital income. It's less difficult in relation to earnings. It's a lot easier to define what you mean by output and expenditure. And what's going on in all of this is that it has been, been becoming, over time, easier to uh, monitor and administer taxes that are levied on transactions and harder and harder to administer and levy taxes that are based, require some calculation or some judgment into the assessment of taxation. And if I can just look at what has happened over tax, uh, to tax over the last 50 years, you can, uh, you can, I think, see a substantial element of that. As far as personal income tax is concerned, uh, and nothing much has happened. The big change has been in the proportion of tax that comes from social security taxes and the proportion that comes from a general consumption tax. Now, that's something that is true not just in Britain. It's true in essentially all OCD countries. And it happened between um, the 1960s and the mid-1990s. In fact, tax systems around the world have changed a lot over the 50 years history of IFS, and they changed mostly in the first 25 years of that history and not in the second. You can see that there was essentially a stabilization from the 1990s, and things don't look that different now from what they, they looked then. Now, what's behind that, you'll see, is the rise is in general consumption taxes and social security taxes. It's a rise in the relative proportion that comes from taxes which are levied on transactions. And as I say, that has happened right around the world. Second thing you can see is happening there. Um, Helen mentioned I, I believed in fiscal neutrality. And that has happened, and it happened in that first part of the period, on quite a spectacular scale. We moved, I remember giving, going, reminiscing again, giving a talk in the 1990s, and I used the phrase fiscal neutrality, which was then rather unfamiliar to people. And I remember being denounced, firstly, by someone from a building societies association who said that, of course, the purpose of the tax system was to encourage owner occupation. And then someone from an oil company got up and said the purpose of the tax system should surely be to encourage oil exploration 
<laughs> and people went on and on about the list of things that, uh, uh, which happened to have something to do with the industries they represented, which the tax system ought to encourage. We had a big shift away from that to a, a much more neutral tax system. We've since, in the second part of the period, I think if anything, we've seen a move back, backwards in relation to that. That the idea that the tax system is there to encourage the good and discourage the bad is a lot more prevalent today now than it was a decade or two ago. Third big change which occurred is in rate structures. And this, like the other changes I've been describing, is an international <coughs> tendency. The number of rates uh, in income tax schedules has fallen markedly, and the highest rates of income tax have fallen markedly. And that, again, has happened around the world, and it happened in the first 25 years of IFS's 50 years, uh, and nothing much has happened again in the second part of that. Why did that happen? It's a variety of things. It's partly that uh, people have been slightly more better in understanding that there is a difference between average and marginal rates of tax. That it's marginal rates of tax that have the incentive effect, and it's average rates of tax uh, that have the revenue effect. That's a basic principle of income tax design that is difficult to get across to people who haven't understood, done, undertaken at least a one semester course in calculus sometime in their lifetime. And twice in that 50 years, we've seen the introduction of the foolish low starting rate of tax. And twice in the history of IFS, we've seen the realization that this is a silly thing to do and the withdrawal of that lower uh, starting rate of tax. It's based on a simple misunderstanding in large part of this difference between average and marginal rates of tax. But we have had that change. It's an improvement, uh, and it's an improvement which has occurred around the world. So I think we've seen these three changes in this direction. We've seen more fiscal neutrality. We've seen a flattening of rate schedules, and we've seen a move away from judgment and calculation-based taxes to, um, to transaction-based taxes. Partly intentional, partly unintentional. But in all of these, I think, a tendency in the direction of improvement. I wish I could say I felt confident that that direction of improvement is, uh, will continue. But I worry that when people have the discussions of this kind, there is the idea that there is some simple, effective tax system waiting to get out if only political constraints on it would be removed. And the bad news is, I'm afraid, there really isn't. Defining economic and social concepts in ways that are capable of being administered is actually quite a complicated and difficult task. That was all terribly upbeat until that last, uh, <laughs> and that, until that last moment. Apart, apart from the sort of I thought the underlying sense that you felt the IFS might have packed up and gone home 25 years ago because all of the good was done by then. But let's hope that uh, hope that that's not uh, hope that that's not true. Um, uh, Gideon, one of the things that you obviously um, you think about a lot is not so much what is the right design for the tax system, but what do the population to think about uh, the, the tax system and how we can achieve the sorts of things that John and Helen have been talking about, which is actually to get people to pay taxes that are reasonably fair and reasonably um, efficient. Do, do, does what the population has to say about this give you grounds for optimism, or are we, um, are, are we severely constrained in what we can do for political economy reasons, essentially? Uh, so I'd, I'd like to be uh, optimistic, and I'll try to end by being optimistic, um, <laughs> unlike John, but I will start with, by, by thinking about the challenges um, that you face, and there's lots of difficulties involved in engaging uh, the public about tax, um, but I think you can probably broadly group those into three. <laughs> So you have difficulties around the lack of engagement. Uh, you have difficulties around questions about who, what the tax is for, where, how it's going to be administered, um, who's going to have to pay for it. Um, and then you have questions around 
implementation. And so um, you think about engagement and the lack of engagement now, you know, outside um, the, the, the chosen few in this room, uh, you know, it's an obvious point, but tax is, is uh, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a great uh, warmer of the public's uh, various uh, cockles of their hearts. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously, it's a negative thing, but also actually it's quite a scare, it can be quite a scary topic to talk about. You know, no one wants to receive that letter from the tax man saying um, you've paid your taxes wrong or here's, here's a fine. You know, that, that, that's, a, that's a concern, particularly amongst businesses. They don't want to feel like they're going to get a fine for something. Um, there's obviously a lack of awareness um, about not just the technicalities but many of the broad concepts. And there are many just misperceptions around... Uh, tax and spend in government uh, that, we, that we've seen across a whole range of different areas, but we see it in tax and spending, you know, for example, misperceptions around how much um, companies pay, people underestimate how much com co company tax, business taxes contribute, and they overestimate the amount of tax avoidance, um, they, get, they don't know the size of that 1% that Helen was talking about, um, and how much they contribute to tax. There's lots of misperceptions out there about just the facts. But there's also, and of course, there's also more sort of selfish biases um, as well. So, you know, we think that the very rich need to do more, but actually we ourselves, we're doing, we're doing okay. There's misperceptions around what, or there's, uh, uh, what actually is rich. I mean, uh, I don't know, I'll maybe do a quick show of hands. Who here thinks that 40 grand a year is rich? Okay, it's broadly in line with the population. Only about 11% of the population think that 40 grand is, is rich. Who here thinks that 80 grand is rich? Um, uh, I can't remember what the question is. <laughs> Should never ask these questions with an IFS audience. Um, uh, so only about half the population think that 80 grand is rich. Um, uh, so we have those types of biases. And then, but then actually some of the disengagement is probably rational. I mean, how much... In, uh, agency does the public actually have over how much tax they pay? I mean, you get a, you get a vote once every five years or once every five, five days on kind of current <laughs> uh, performance, but uh, how much of that is really in being engaged over and then having a real decision over the taxes that you pay? Um, not, not a great deal. Maybe it's quite rational for the public to not feel like they've got that much of a say. Um, and then you've obviously got the questions about, about the actual tax. So people have got very different views about whether it's a tax on the NHS or other public services. What is it going to be used for? Um, do people think that government actually needs the money? Um, and do they think that the government can be trusted to spend that effectively um, and fairly? I mean, you know, the sort of in 1997, just as many people as in 1992 thought that Labour was going to raise taxes... But they thought in 1997 Labour could be trusted with this, not in 1992. And of course, questions around fairness. You know, who is it? Is it affecting? Is it affecting the rich? Is it affecting uh, uh, private school fees, or is it affecting pensioners um, and people on low incomes? So lots of questions <coughs> like that. And then finally, there are kind of going to be concerns about implementation. One of the the very problems of the fact that it's quite a complicated tax system that, that John was um, out, outlaying, that it's, it's complex to make these decisions, means that steps to reform it, they can, people will have barriers to, they'll be concerned about the costs to it. Again, if we're talking to businesses, they quite often have got their own ways of dealing with uh, whatever tax that you're talking about. And so if you're talking about changes to that, even if it's supposedly to simplify it, they're worried about, does this mean I'm going to start getting things wrong or I'm going to have to work out a whole new way of what with kind of my special little tricks or shortcuts to work everything out so they're concerned about the costs of change but to be a bit more positive um, there are <laughs> um, it's, it's not all negative I don't think you know obviously people grumble about tax but Britons are not sort of fundamentally anti-tax can recognize there is a duty to contribute money to spend on public services and particularly at the moment um, public opinion moves in cycles uh, when it comes to tax and spend, and after several years of austerity and kind of, as Helen said, very visible pressures on public services, uh, the public mood is, is towards more 
uh, more spending on public services, even if that means higher taxes, and, and particularly if we're talking about services like the NHS. So there is a bit of a change in the public mood. And then just lastly, from a research point of view, being a researcher, it is possible to engage the public on very complex issues. You know, we've done uh, uh, in-depth dialogue uh, pieces of research on issues like social care, how do you pay for social care, on issues like genomics, um, on AI, on data sharing between institutions. So very complicated policy issues. You can go through the public and engage the public and, and talk about it and see what happens when you get a considered view. The difficulty is you can't then mistake that for a change amongst sort of mass public opinion, and that's probably still going to be the challenge going forward when you're talking about tax reform. Uh, does that mean... Um, so one thing that we talk about um, from time to time, probably more than we should, is the, the absurd system we now have of council tax. Now, in a sense, I think, certainly from what John was, I think, <laughs> suggesting, this is a difficult tax to rise because there's no transaction going on, and we currently have this extraordinary world where it's based on 30-year-old values. It's regressive in the sense that more expensive properties pay a smaller fraction of the value of the property. Is your sense, Gideon, that this is something that it is possible to move the population on, or is that, you know, should we just give up? And, and, and John, for similar reasons, should we just give up because it's not a transaction? This is something that we're stuck with. Uh, so, I mean, so one of the other points about tax is that actually on many of these issues there hasn't been the great dialogue with the public on tax that maybe we have seen on some of those other ones that I've talked about, like social care and, and genomics and so on. You know, it'd be great to, to do it. So, but I think from if you look at some of the evidence that you do have, yes, that clearly it's going to be hard, and lots of those things that I talked about will apply. So, very few people know very much about council tax. There's going to be big misperceptions on, for example, how much uh, tax local authorities make and how much revenue local authorities make comes from local areas as opposed to comes from central government. And yes, you probably wouldn't start from here if you were starting from scratch, but given where um, people are, um, and this applies to other taxes like inheritance tax, um, you, you talk about changes to, to wealth tax, despite the prin on taxes on wealth, despite the principles of it, there will still be a strong sense of... Um, yeah, actually, maybe I do uh, have, I have earned some of this. You know, I've paid my mortgage. Mm -hmm. I, I do deserve some of this. And yeah, that is going to be a difficult, I mean, it may well have to happen, but that is going to be a difficult political conversation. I mean, John, is your view that, I mean, is that one of those aspects of wealth, property, that you just can't tax because there's no transaction? Well, it doesn't mean you can't tax it. But it means it's very difficult. You've identified the absurdity of having a valuation base which is 25 years out of date. And it's 25 years out of date <coughs> because if you changed it, you would arouse even more protest than the 25 years out of date one does. And it also has the property. Uh, it has the further properties that it's not based on any transaction. And that comes into the next issue, which is that it is both difficult and unpopular to collect taxes except in the context of some transaction that people are engaging in. So that people, taxes, and I think Gideon will confirm taxes that people actually have to write out checks for, or direct debits for nowadays, are quite a lot more unpopular than taxes that collect, get collected, are added or subtracted when you're actually paying for something else. So that the popularity and the administrative feasibility points actually work together. And we've seen in the way tax systems have developed how that has been true across the board. And can I ask you, John, about um, your views on where we are with corporation tax? Helen spent a, a, a bit of time describing the problems that a globalised world creates and why it's very difficult to find the right way of taxing, whether it be Facebook or Apple or whatever. Um, but, but in a sense, slightly encouraging sense, showed that as a fraction of national income, corporate taxes haven't come down that much over time. Are you optimistic about the future of corporation tax? Well, there are two reasons why they haven't come down that much more. Uh, right, It's quite surprising that the, you saw from the 90s they've actually gone up again. But that's largely driven by the share of corporate profits in GDP. Um, so that uh, as with the share of taxes paid by the top 1%. It's a combination of what has happened to the base 
and what has happened to the rates that has produced the numbers we observe. But to my mind, the basic issue of corporation tax, well, and this goes back to some of the reason why corporate tax receipts have increased. Corporation, we need to understand that corporation tax is not so much a tax on capital income as a tax on economic rents generated within the corporate sector. Now, we've increased specific taxes on corporate rents. There are now quite a number of them. Oil taxes are the clearest example of that. But let's say the various levies on the financial system are another part of that. And that's some of what has driven that increase in the share of corporate tax in, in GDP. But once we say that the, there's an issue of trying to tax rents, some problems arise immediately from that. One is the idea of an arm's length principle applied to a tax on economic rent is hopeless because it's by the nature of re economic rent that it's a product of some kind of monopoly and there can't be a bona fide arm's length transaction. And the uh, failure to understand the implications of that, it seems to me, is a large part of the problem. That gets to the issue of how can you attach, or sensibly attach, a location to an economic rent. It's easy where it's a production rent, like oil or mineral resources. The other is where you're selling, where it's a consumption rent, where you're selling Coca-Cola or whiskey or whatever it might be, where the rent arises really in the country in which it's sold. Uh, but all of that means, I think, in a globalized world, this is not a tax which is either going to raise a lot of revenue or which is uh, capable of being administered in a way that is, is non-distortionary. So actually, bulk of our corporation tax revenue, I think now, arises from rents that are identifiably generated domestically. They come from sectors like retailing or they come from small businesses that operate within, within some very limited location. And that's not a very satisfactory basis for taxes. Yeah, and, and what you said about oil and, and financial, uh, financial sector reminds me of something that a uh, very senior um, Treasury official um, said to me, which was that uh, you know, in his lifetime, the UK has had two huge windfalls, one from oil uh, revenues, one from the financial sector, and we blew them both. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, I mean, Helen, on, on the corporate side, I mean, I, it feels to me that what... The, the consequence of what John was saying um, is that if we're thinking about the rents being effectively earned by these service companies in, as a result of the consumption in the countries where they're consumed, I mean, does that drive you towards more consumption taxes as a replacement for corporate tax to some extent? Uh, I mean, it's certainly one of the options. And I think John also highlighted that there are some things like oil, and I think for developing countries it's more important where there's a, there's a natural resource there so I think people sometimes hear consumption taxes and worry that resource-heavy countries won't be able to tax. I think there's always a special tax on resources. But, but yes, I mean, consumers tend to be less mobile as well, meaning that, you know, I'm not going to go move to France if there's a, if there's a tax that ends up being in the UK. So that they're, they're better in that sense, they're less mobile. And yes, if the rents are coming to, from something to do with uh, the kind of final market, then it sort of heads you in that direction. I mean, I think another thing to say is that we're kind of heading in that direction anyway. You've seen corporate tax rates come down, and we're getting more from VAT. That kind of is a move away from taxing corporates and you know, away towards taxing consumption. And actually, whether, how you feel about that sort of depends on the incidence of corporation tax. We really want you to look through the mechanisms you're using and think about who fundamentally is being taxed. And people worry that we're not taxing shareholders, and now we're taxing consumers. Um, but actually part of what you're doing with a corporation tax is you're ending up taxing consumers and workers, not just shareholders, and there are other ways to tax shareholders. So that's a kind of long-winded way of saying there are various ways we could change our tax system, and the mechanisms don't necessarily pit, you know, map one-to-one -one on who's actually being taxed at the end of the day. But I think moving towards something more like consumers would probably be what we'll end up doing anyway, regardless of whether we do it um, consciously or unconsciously, but also would be easier to, to pull off because they're less mobile. But let's be careful. If it's a tax on economic rent earned from in consumption, imposing it on sales is not a tax on the consumers. It's a tax on the corporation. Yeah. I agree. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and we need to understand that. Yeah. It, 
if you can levy them effectively, taxes and economic rents are quite attractive. This is a really important point. I mean, the, 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 just to reiterate, because I think it's really important. Clearly, if you're, um, I think people have the sense of corporation taxes as uh, victimless taxes. They're clearly not victimless taxes. Um, it looks like a tax on consumption is not a victimless tax. It is no more or less victimless than a tax on corporations, and it may be very, very similar in the monopoly-type world that John's describing, and that, that sort of difficulty in terms of understanding the incidents is desperately important. I wanted, Helen, to come to, uh, before I open it up to the audience, uh, sort of one last question about your talk. You could take your talk as being rather pessimistic about the possibility of you genuinely getting a chunk more money from the rich, which is actually quite a lot of where the, the public debate is. I mean, as you, as, as you alluded to, um, the last Labour manifesto, not only in its um, focus on higher marginal rates of income tax at the top, but in terms of a whole series of other things, including, including corporate taxes and closing, ta closing tax loopholes and so on, was suggesting significant additional revenue from what you might think of as big companies and, and the rich. Um, do, do you think, I mean, are you as pessimistic as you sort of sounded about the possibility of, um, of, of, of that, or are there more, are there other ways of, of, of you know, squeezing those pips, to um, <laughs> use a phrase from the early days of the, yeah. of the uh, IFS? Well, I think there's two things to say. One is it really does, as, as Gideon was saying, depend on who you think is rich. I mean, if you're earning £50,000, you're in the top 10% of the UK population. So people feel like the squeeze middle, but they're earning more than most people. So... If we define the rich to mean, you know, a broader group, then yes, obviously they're a bigger group and you can get more revenue from them. If we really, really do mean just the very tip of the iceberg, then I think the way to try to get more revenue is to find cleverer ways to do it. So I described how just putting up marginal rates of income tax doesn't tend to lead to much revenue. That's partly just because it's a small group to start with. So even if they had no behavioural response, you don't get large sums because they just aren't a very big group. Um, but also they're very responsive. But I think you can also look at how they manage to be responsive. So, for example, people can put money into pensions and get you know, lower taxes through that way. We've changed how we do that now, so that's less of an option. But also people can switch out of being taxed as an employee and into being a business owner, for example. Then you can get some really juicy tax rates. So if we wanted to tax the very rich, I think we could find some other cleverer ways to do it by looking at how we tax business owners or other people who are going to be more you know, up at the top of the distribution um, or think about his capital income. So rather than just always focus on the top rate of income tax, which is very salient, I think we could look at other things. So I think, you know, am I, so if, if the goal is to raise more from the top, yes, I think there are other ways to do it. I don't think, however we do it, we're going to get tons and tons and tons more. So we get more, for sure, and that might help with issues around equality. But we're not going to get enough more that we're going to radically reshape the states on, on, I don't think, on the back of a very small group of people. Look, we've got about half an hour left. I think now it's your turn to ask some questions. I have some questions which have been pre-sent um, to us, so um, we'll try and bring some of those in um, as well. Now, if there's anyone at the top, I really can't see at the top, so you'll have to shout, I'm afraid. But um, uh, let's, let's go up to the left here. And um, that's hard in the light. How much attention <clears throat> should you pay to compliance costs, i.e. making ease of compliance and ease of collection? So I should have said before that that um, you're on telly if you uh, ask a question. So um, but do, 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 um, that, that was fine, but if anyone else was um, uh, you know, thinking of um, saying anything more controversial, this is being live, uh, live streamed. Um, importance of compliance costs. Uh, who would like to take that? John? <laughs> well, how could one say compliance costs weren't important? Uh, and that gets back, I think, to the issue of what tax, what is involved in actually translating these economic concepts into things that you can actually feasibly administer. And compliance costs of transactions-based taxes are relatively low. Compliance cost-based uh, compliance costs of these, as it were, judgment and valuation-based taxes are that much higher. And they're higher both in terms of administrative costs for whoever is uh, operating the tax and for the, the people who are paying the tax. It's also true that there's the, the further connection that there's 
typically more opportunity to argue and to avoid the taxes which are on these more complicated bases. I, I want the theme of what I've said tonight really to be the idea which I think is not sufficiently widely grasped, that the variety of tax bases we have and do have are very different in terms of their ease of operation and administrability. And I think that has been overlooked in a view that everything is very difficult. And whatever you do, taxpayers will, taxpayers will try to get round it, and politicians will drive holes in it. Some of these things are true, but they're not as true as this debate often suggests. Does compliance get in? I mean, is that one of the things that comes up in your work? I mean, is, is, is the idea that if you make this easier, people are happier? Or would they rather, you know, actually be engaged? Because that, if, I, if I look at some of the pre-set questions that we've been sent, I mean, they kind of go in two different directions, actually. I mean, there's, there's one question here, actually, from Edward Troop, formerly head of the HMRC, saying, uh, wouldn't it be great if taxpayers had no more involvement in their tax bill than they do in their gas bill, which I guess for HMRC is great because it just comes in <laughs> without any trouble. But we've got another question here saying, wouldn't it be great if we had universal tax returns so that everyone was engaged? So I mean, those are almost uh, precise opposite ends of the spectrum and people uh, so in favour of, of each of those. I mean, uh, where, 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 do you have any sense of where the population might sit on that? Is it sort of, you know... It comes out automatically and we're not engaged, but, you know, goodness knows how much is going to come out of our bank account, or is it sort of, I really want to, you know, see every last penny? Um, so I'm not going to pretend to know the exact answer to that, but to speculate um, to some extent, um, it partly depends on what you mean by engagement. So uh, will the public <coughs> thank you um, for uh, making them fill out a, a long, complicated tax <laughs> return uh, every year, um, I doubt it, uh, at a slightly different level of engagement to them feeling they have some sort of agency or, or, or say over their uh, tax levels, which maybe is a, different, is a different matter. I mean, broadly, if you ask people, they will want simplicity, they will want ease of use. Um, you know, there is not something that... I mean, even entrepreneurs who are setting up their, their own businesses... They often don't, th you know, they don't think about ta you know, tax is not the point as far as they're concerned. You know, the, po the point is setting up their business, making money, <coughs> doing whatever it is that they're, they're, they're trying to do. So it's, it's not going to be a, a great point. Um, you know, again, the, the, the annual tax return, the annual tax sort of summaries that are sent out, um, people like the principle of it, but... <coughs> most people aren't terribly engaged. They think it's something that government should be doing, but whether but it's changing... For other people. people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. They like, you like to know it's there. But also, if we're talking about compliance costs, I think we can't underestimate the significance of the point that a, a situation where um, the local builder pays more corporation tax than Vodafone <coughs> do is not something that is defensible or sustainable. And if we're, if we're to get any sensible dialogue about tax compliance, we have to address that, that kind of issue in one way or another. Yeah, so I don't think that means that the public doesn't think that tax is, is <coughs> unimportant. It's just what do you mean by, enga yeah. by engaging with them on them? Okay, uh, Bill here. Uh, I've been a zealot for fiscal neutrality mm -hmm. since working on, with Tony Atkinson, on the move from uh, purchase tax to VAT. Um, and so <coughs> I, I do think some of the compliance things you solve by going through um, uh, towards fiscal neutrality. You know, um, uh, TV licence, for example, is a fairly universal um, standard effect. But... The question I wanted to ask was actually about the other half of the Mer Merrilee's um, review, which is uh, the what should be the view about the integration of tax and benefits. And particularly, I'm with the way you set up this system where you have the tax and benefits completely separate. 
partly because HMRC are useless at giving out money and DWP are useless at taking money okay. off of people. <laughs> so, so you've answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I, I think that things like tax credit <coughs> or universal credit, should we go for an integrated or disintegrated? People have very different understandings of what an integrated tax and benefit system mean, um, of course. But um, I will again turn to John, because you've, um, you've sort of written the book on this, in a sense. Yeah. I mean, way back in the early 1980s, we did write a book on integration of tax and benefits. And we identified that, A, it was a good idea, B, there were two main difficulties. And the two main difficulties were, uh, what was the unit, that the sensible unit for taxation was increasingly thought to be the individual, and the type of sensible unit for purpose of benefits was generally thought to be the household. And it's difficult to weigh, get away from that conflict. And the second difficulty was that the time scale that was relevant to the budgeting of people who received benefits was typically different from the time scale, the annual time scale on which income tax was, uh, uh, was levied. And a variety of attempts have been made to increase the integration of tax and benefits since then, uh, quite a lot over the years, without any recognition really either of how fundamental these problems are or of the ways in which they've, in practice, presented obstacles to making that integration effective. And we've seen the huge difficulties that were involved in the rollout of tax credits and again in the rollout of universal credit, which in some senses have been trying to use the, the, so the tax, tax credits for bumped up to, uh, against this Usually universal credit in exactly, just the same exactly. way. But, um, I, I'm going to come to John Chown now, since he was the um, he, he is the founder of the IFS, who is currently present. So sorry to everybody else, but I think he gets uh, he gets preference. Right. Thank you. Um, I begin, to begin with a comment. Ooh, I think the, most sure important, the most there. important thing I did for the IFS was a few years in, and we decided we needed a new director, and the director was going to be a director of the, with a research background, and the administrator was going to be his subordinate. Uh, I dropped at the advertisement. I was astonished and delighted by the reply, or one of the replies we got. And we, we took on John Kay, and that was the start of the IFS takeoff. So that's the first question. My, my, I had two questions, but I mean, before, one of them is that the tax system, the, the corporate the tax system has got a hugely longer. I mean, when you had a, a yellow, we used to have a thin yellow book, and we, now, we, now we have a line book. <coughs> and I think one of the, part of the complexity is the attitude to, partly, it's trying to do too much. Another is a tax avoidance. What happens? We see a, we, we see a case of what I've seen happen time and again. Somebody says this is tax avoidance, when I would regard it as, as intelligent tax planning. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, they, so, so that we must stop that. And there's big publicity in the Times about these things and you know, all sort of things. And then, so they, they bring in legislation to stop it, and they find that creates uh, it, it creates some hard cases. So they bring in new legislation to bring in hard cases. So that hard cases create new loopholes, and so it goes on. And the, the legislation grows like that. Is there anything we can do about that? Because that's, if, if we can do that, it strikes me as one of the ways we can really deal with tax simplification. That's, um, <coughs> that's a really good question. The way you describe it certainly makes it sound unavoidable. But uh, uh, Helen, do you have a, a view on that? Get the design right. I mean, we, I think we, we have these problems because we put in place taxes that we know have... Um, Challenges like we put in place a corporation tax that gives people incentives to shift profits, then we spend lots of time trying to stop them shifting profits, yeah. or we have big differences across different legal forms, and people switch legal forms, then we have this avoidance rule to stop them switching legal forms. So I'm not sure it's easy to do, but if you just stopped the problem, I mean, and John's right, it's complicated, but there are lots of cases where we could just get the design more sen you know, make the design more sensible, take away the big incentives to do all this shifting, and then you wouldn't have to do as much patching up. So, yeah, get the design right. It's one of the big advantages of anything that looks a bit like fiscal neutrality. I mean, it's, as Helen was alluding to, if you charge people who are self-employed a lot less tax than employees, it's not surprising that people claim to be self-employed. And if you, uh, if you charge incorporated entities less again, then it's not surprised that people try and do that. Or if you charge less tax on capital income than earned income, it's not a surprise that people try to make their earned income look like 
um, capital income. So, I mean, that's a, in, a, in a way, it's a slightly glib answer, but it is actually a fundamental problem that if you have a system which starts from a non-neutral system, you're bound to have these kinds of complexities. Did you want to add to that, John? I think all I'd want to add is the best way to tackle tax avoidance is to construct tax bases that are difficult to avoid. And that's, <laughs> and that's well, if, just if a I thought I was being glib. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll uh, move on to the next question. Nick's uh, being very keen. To ask a question about an issue that wasn't there 50 years ago very much, but it is now becoming bigger and bigger, and that's intergenerational fairness. Because it seems to me that, uh, from the very useful evidence you presented, there are various ways in which the uh, tax system is becoming a happy hour for baby boomers, particularly the well-off. Uh, just uh, to count the, the, the advantages they have on the consu consumption taxes are somewhat weighted towards lower income groups, particularly the specific ones. Secondly, uh, the council tax is clearly a massive benefit to people with more expensive properties who paid off their mortgages. Thirdly, the capital gains allowance is very, very generous. And uh, <coughs> finally, uh, the fact that uh, the better off uh, over 65s don't pay uh, 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 NICs. Uh, hasn't the system become, in fact, an absolute bonanza for the better off underneath your rather uh, studious uh, calculations? Well, uh, well let, let, let me abuse my position as chair by, um, by taking that one first, since uh, I've, I've you know, thought about that, that a bit. I mean, there's certainly some truth in what you say. I mean, one thing is it's always important as ever to distinguish age from cohort effects. So it, it, it is the case that the older population is always going to be those who own the houses outright more than the younger population and so on. And a lot of the wealth that the older population currently own will at some point move to the younger generation when they, uh, when they die. That itself will create problems of, of equity, particularly given the inheritance tax isn't desperately um, effective. But I think your fundamental point is is right, and I think Helen alluded to this in, in, in what she was saying, is that uh, you know, we have mistakes, I think, in the tax system which have uh, accumulated to create uh, degrees of inequity. So, for example, the lack of tax on gains in, in, in occupied housing, when you add that to the fact that we've happened to have now very low rates of interest and requirements for high deposits has put a huge premium in the housing market on those who already have some wealth, which is one of the one of the reasons why we've moved astonishingly back from owner occupation on people in their 20s and 30s who are broadly speaking renting their housing from their parents generation now that's not just to do with tax but it's to do with the way the <coughs> tax system has interacted with what's happened in uh, with, with interest rates in the financial system there are other aspects of tax system which are completely it seems to me um, undefensible in fact if you have a defined contribution uh, pension pot, uh, you can leave it entirely free of inheritance tax. So we have something called a pension, which the best thing you can do with it is never use it as a pension, uh, is to hold on to it um, till, uh, till the end. We, we have no capital gains tax uh, at death and a whole series of other things going. The last thing I, I, I would say is the trouble is it's quite difficult, I think, politically or publicly to change some of these things because people have a view about what is retrospective taxation. So if you get to 65 or 70 and you have a pension pot and you're not expecting to pay national insurance contributions on it, for example, however reasonable it might be to charge national insurance, given there's never been national insurance on it, on the contributions, given that you, are, you get there, it's quite difficult because it looks retrospective because people were expecting something different. In reality, of course, there's any tax is retrospective. If I put my effort into becoming a high earner and you increase tax, well, that's sort of retrospective because I tried to become a high earner. If you increase VAT, um, then that's sort of retrospective because I'm spending money that I earned um, in the past. So I think there is, a, there is a sort of philosophical issue here, which is quite hard to, hard to, um, hard to get across. Sorry, I will now um, behave and let my fellow panel members uh, <laughs> I get a word, uh, a, a word in edgeways. I mean, Gideon, I mean, is this something? Is, is this issue of intergenerational equity something that you've 
looked at and thought about? Uh, so yes, and we've, do we've done lots on um, attitudes towards intergenerational um, fairness um, with different partners um, and different think tanks um, from the Resolution Foundation and, and others. Um, and I suppose there's, there's two aspects to it. Um, first of all, is that you're, you're, you're absolutely right about the kind of the growing levels of concern uh, around the, uh, the difficulties facing younger generations, um, particularly when that comes to issues around employment and income and so on. It sort of people might think they kind of they have better opportunities when it comes to education and, and they're living in a more socially liberal world. But when you're talking about um, concerns about pensions, housing, employment prospects, and so on, there's very clear signs that people are much more worried about well, the, the, the problems facing younger generations. It's not clear that that is turning into levels of um, kind of intergenerational. Um, I'm trying to think of a better phrase than, than sort of warfare, um, but you know, <laughs> uh, you know, it's not there's 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 not huge there's elements of sort of resentment, intergenerational resentment, but not at very high <coughs> levels. So people want more to be done for the younger generations. But I think as as Paul was exactly right in saying, kind of if you if you then go to say therefore you need to tax pensioners more or you need to. Um, reduce tax relief on pensions or you need to take away um, the free TV licences, then there, there's a lot of opposition to that. People think about their own grandparents, they have a perception of people have contributed and so therefore they, they deserve these things and there's a perception obviously that, uh, and, and an awareness that there's also high levels of um, uh, poverty and low income amongst older generations as well. So there's concern but at the moment it's not turning into a Kind of, and therefore, we must take from the old to give to the young. Okay. Um, well, should we get some more questions in? I'll try not to be the one answering them. Um, I'm aware that we've uh, not yet had any questions from anybody other than a man. Uh, but uh, Jill. Yeah. is there? Jill. I, it's very hard to see. All right, Jill. Jill. Right, excellent. I was trying to say Gemma to uh, ask a question because I noticed that as well. Um, Jill Retter from the Institute for Government. Um, I wanted to ask the panels, you've been incredibly good at telling us the barriers to changing anything on tax. But I wanted particularly maybe to ask Gideon, uh, though maybe John and Helen have views too. Cut you out, Paul. Um, <laughs> very wise, you need very to wise. Chair. Um, actually, if you were thinking of how do you sell a tax, tax reform to the public, how do you do it? Because at the moment you're presenting this great dilemma, but you're telling us you can't do this, you can't appeal to that, people don't like this, people don't like that. Even taxes, hardly anyone's ever going to pay, like inheritance tax, people think it's just an unfair tax, so they don't want to do that. So actually, if you flip the question around, how do we frame the next generation of tax reforms to get people to agree to it? So yeah, how do we communicate about tax? How do we frame issues in tax so that people engage and are willing to accept change? And, and, so, and, and, and potentially accept just more tax in the future given, given the way that de de demographics and so on are moving. So there's, there's, there's probably two questions there and we probably know more about the kind of actually getting acceptance of more tax than about the more complex issues around tax reform. Um, so the kind of... It is, if you're just taking into account the, the broader political and economic context um, at the moment, we are in an area where there is a bit more public support for the idea of um, taxation. You know, there is support for, not to use the phrase hypothecated taxes, but, you know, there is support for the idea of <coughs> higher taxes to pay for the NHS. Actually, people supported the idea that uh, of, of, of uh, May's recent tax rises for the NHS, increased spending for the NHS, but actually even though they thought that this would not be enough, you know, there's still a sense that even that on its own is not going to be enough. So there is support for that. Um, you can go back to 2002, uh, Gordon Brown's uh, NHS budget was very well received, um, and it wasn't what people might forget is that it wasn't just seen as good for the country. I mean, that was broadly, you know, there was the highest proportion of people thought it was good for the country. They also thought it was good for themselves. Not quite to the same extent, but they did think it was good for themselves, which suggests that people don't take a kind of a really incredibly reductive attitude towards tax. They do think about it over, you know, as an overall view. They take into account 
the wider benefits, both to society and themselves, that they may get from, from again, taking an example of increased spending on, on the NHS. So, you know, that's an, e that's an easy answer. So there, there is something there. Um, and much harder about, you know, if you're talking about sort of tax reform and changes to the, the system of tax, I mean, I think that's one of the areas where we just don't know, you know, we haven't, I'm not sure the research has been done to, to answer what does it take to get the public to just engage in the first place and then to start going through, you know, actually what are the underlying principles? I mean, you'd think things like fairness are going to, and, and kind of levels of contribution are obviously going to be key to that and would be the first place that you'd start and issues around simplicity and so on following on from it. Um, but I'm not sure that the definitive study has been done on that. Sean, I think you've suggested in the past that in some slightly counterintuitive way, big changes may be easier than small changes. I, I, I think that's right because, well, I think the way you do comprehensive tax reform is on the back of buoyant revenues. So you can ensure that almost everyone is a winner. And the only way you can ensure that almost everyone is a winner is to have a comprehensive package. This is a cake and eat it solution. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, 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 that's right. Uh, but also it's why the package is easier than the piecemeal part, because then in any piecemeal reform, there are going to be both winners and losers. Yeah, so make sure everyone's a winner is the, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure terribly helpful advice there. <laughs> well, but, but, but the, two, the, the, the principal era of comprehensive tax reform was the 1980s. When and incomes which exactly were rising that fast. Happened, yes. Yeah, exactly. I think one thing, I mean, I'm not, I think it's a hope rather than a definitely think it's going to happen, but I think we can probably get better at explaining to people why we think the problems we have are actually problems. I think talking about efficiency doesn't get anyone very excited, whereas I think if you can actually see why something's a problem, it's more compelling. So, for example, I know lots of people, if lots of people here, have spent years saying that it's a problem we've been, you know, we tax different legal forms very differently, so employees, self-employed, and managers. Why are we talking that, about that more recently? Because we see gig economy workers who aren't, who obviously aren't, you know, entrepreneurs who are benefiting from this system, they're being, they're having more costs imposed on them by the way that work is being restructured. So I think finding ways to show real concrete examples where tax um, is making people worse off rather than just always looking at the benefits of it. I think it's probably a good way to start trying to convince people that fixing it could be better than letting the problem get worse. That's my hope, at least. So we're, going to, we're going to try to do that. Okay, others. Um, there's one up there. So you will have to wave hard <laughs> to catch my attention because the lights are quite bright. Um, hi. I'm Surprise! No one's mentioned taxing externalities like congestion and pollution and things more, and we've still been very much focused on the tax base of um, essentially employment income, which is something we want more of. Um, important point. I mean, I think part of the answer is uh, in John's um, and, and Helen's number showing that that's not where the money comes from at the moment and never really has been. But uh, John, taxing externalities. Um, good idea in principle starts typically messing up the tax system as a whole when you do it in practice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the colleagues of mine who work on externalities taxing beaming at me that it's, but we're pleased that we've got the question. And I think there are ways we could design taxes to try to correct some externalities. That what you need to do, I guess, is find ones where. The benefits you get from trying to correct an externality are big enough to make it worth the cost of adding some extra compliance. So you don't want to go, go mad and keep adding taxes to try and fix every problem, but where you can find a tax that's very well targeted at an externality, where the benefits of correcting some kind of behaviour, whether it be smoking or drinking <coughs> or polluting, are big enough, then um, we probably should find ways to, to do that, but not get carried away. I think part, part, part of the important point here is that... Um, uh, I mean, I think two things. First, you're never going to get big money from this relative to the rest of the system. I mean, we we're always going to get the vast majority from consumption and, uh, and income. Easily the biggest tax on externalities at the moment is the tax on petrol and driving, and that is falling pretty swiftly at the moment, um, despite actually being a consumption uh, tax, which goes along with a transaction, but <coughs> partly because it has to rise each year in 
um, uh, nominal terms to remain the same in real terms, and partly because we're going to move to a different form of transport over the next 20 years, we assume, towards uh, electric vehicles. So it's actually the biggest tax on externalities that we have is, is, is disappearing um, over time. But I think John's, um, John's point is, is actually a terribly important one, which is, in a sense, we need to move away from neutrality only when we are very clear that the benefits of doing so are substantive enough to overcome the additional complexity, uh, compliance, uh, and, and, and so on, which is there. In history, we've probably tried to do that too often rather than not often uh, enough, but there are clearly times um, where this has been quite effective on a small scale. Plastic bag taxes, fizzy drinks taxes have made a big, very little difference to the amount of tax we raise, but quite big difference actually to the way in which um, either consumers or producers uh, behave in order to respond to that. So there is real power to some of these, actually relatively small taxes in terms of um, raising, in terms of raising money. Um, here. Thank you. Um, there's been a couple of proposals recently from a couple of uh, sort of left of centre think tanks to do away with the personal allowance in income tax, which is very costly, and instead just replace that with a payment that goes to everybody uh, on the basis that will give more money to people lower down the income scale. I was just wondering what you think of that, whether it's viable, uh, whether the authors have done their homework, or whether it's actually uh, garbage. <laughs> <laughs> So this is essentially replacing the income tax personal allowance with a universal basic income. It's the sort of... Yeah. Like the one from the yeah. NEF. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that John has written about this. <laughs> yeah. If you do the numbers on these kind of schemes, you realise that either the tax rate, <coughs> either the basic income is unacceptably low of the tax rate you need to finance it is unacceptably high. End of story. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, to, to put a little gloss on that, well, well, it, it is really. I mean, I mean, if, I mean if, you, if you think that um, an income to everyone of 20% of average income, which is not very much, is about the basic state pension, is what your universal basic income will be, or well, that's going to cost you 20% of national income. And that will be um, in addition to tax at the moment. So that's, um, you know, that, that, that's the sort of arithmetic of it. And it, uh, in terms of universal incomes, of course, it also relates to the fact that that's nowhere near enough to cover the costs of disability, children, housing, and all those sorts of, uh, all those sorts of, um, all those sorts of things. So that's, uh, you know, boring, 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 but the arithmetic doesn't work. Yes, I mean, basically, if you want to help poor people, uh, you can either target benefits on the contingencies that lead to people being poor, sickness, unemployment, old age, etc. Or you can target your benefits on the fact of being poor. Once you've framed it that way, you quickly realise that in order to get benefits efficiently to people who need them, you need to do both. And that is what the systems we have and what creates the complexity of... Uh, the system. And we've always been torn ever since we first introduced benefit systems by people who want to move to one, to one or the other. The back to beverage schemes that involve purely contingent benefits or the basic income, <coughs> negative income tax schemes that involve purely income related benefits. You have to do both in order to get a system that meets necessary requirements at reasonable cost. One more question, uh, Fran. This was actually a question sent in by the Women's Budget Group, but we haven't used very many of the questions that were sent in, so I thought I'd say it as well. Great. <laughs> Do you think there's enough uh, impact assessment of the effect of the tax system by gender? Uh, any of my colleagues like to respond? <laughs> well, I think for lots of taxes, it's hard to do impact assessments on people in general, let alone opinion people on other characteristics. So I guess I'd like to see more impact assessments that took into account things like tax incidents or behavioural responses, and I think I'd probably put them high up my list before I added 
additional characteristics of, of people. I remember when I was first at IFS, it was still the case that Inland Revenue, as it said then was, sent letters to women saying, if you are a married woman, treat this letter as if it were addressed to your husband. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's another area in which we advanced. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's a, that, is a, that is a positive <laughs> note. <laughs> a, a, positive note to, um, a, a positive note to end on. Um, it, it bang on um, it's bang on 8 o'clock. Um, Thank you, um, everyone, for coming, and to, uh, to, to John, to Gideon, and to Helen for uh, their, great, uh, their great contributions. Let me just, ju let me just end uh, by saying, again, um, this is uh, the second in a series of five of these events that we're running. The next one will be on uh, retirement income, so those of you who are particularly interested in intergenerational equity <coughs> and that sort of thing uh, can come along on the 25th um, of June here again. Um, where my colleague Carl Emerson will be giving the talk and we'll be having um, as our alumnus Steve Webb, the former pensions minister, uh, and Sarah Harper from Oxford um, on, on the panel. In the autumn we'll be having an event on education and another one on essentially the future of uh, public spending. So do, uh, do keep those uh, in your diaries. Do continue to support uh, us at the IFS going forward. We uh, have a membership scheme. I hope everyone here is a member and if you're not, please uh, please join up, and if you're a corporate person, please make sure your company uh, joins or find some other way uh, to support us. Um, uh, we, only, um, we only have impact through uh, the way in which we talk to people like you and the way that you um, that then send our messages on to those who uh, can make a difference uh, to, uh, to policy. I very much hope that my successor will be here or somewhere similar in another 50 years celebrating our 100th anniversary and that there will be more progress towards a better tax system and maybe one that's also better for women as well. Thank you very much.